Hey guys, Joe here, back to the word today with a video. The title says it all, Why Porn Must Die, an honest talk about killing sin and pursuing Christ. I know because of the title, it's gonna get lots of clicks. So let me say up front, the audience for this video is Christians, those who follow Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord and want to live the way the Bible calls us to live. I'd encourage you specifically for men to watch this video, but also Christian ladies, you're more than willing to listen in. For those who are not saved, who are not Christians, honestly, this video, I don't hold these values or these um, things for you. This is not something I can impose on you, but this is something that for those who have believed in Jesus Christ, I think the Bible calls us to, and we should be talking about the way God calls us to use our sex and sexuality and our bodies for him according to his word in the way he has told us to do so and I felt I needed to do this video. I want to say also up front I would encourage you to watch the entire video. Yes it's time stamped you can jump to specific sections of the video but in order to get the context the full context of what I'm saying I would just encourage you to watch the entire video. It's probably going to be a little longer but I just want to say that up front. I also want to say I have some notes here that I'm going to be going through and reading specifically from. And I want to talk about why I'm doing this video. Um, one reason is I just finished reading this book, The Death of Porn, um, Men of Integrity Building a World of Nobility from Ray Ortland, pastor in Nashville. Excellent writer. This is a short book. It was a beautiful book. But it talked about um, meeting this challenge head on. What is pornography doing to us, doing to our communities, doing to our families, and doing to the church? And so I was encouraged by that. I also was encouraged to talk about how we can glorify God in our bodies and use our sexuality. We don't talk about that a lot of times in the church. I remember right after reading this book, talking with our youth pastor, and I do more college ministry and digital media for the church, and just talking about how it's difficult sometimes to bring that up in even a youth group or a church setting. You don't want to be known as the pornography pastor or the guy who's always talking about this. And you don't kind of want that attached to your image, but this is something that's killing the church. I went and found some stats and I'm going to link those studies in the description for the video. Most of them are rooted back to um, Barna in their studies. But did you know that every second, so this is every second in the US and the world as a whole, that 28,000, over 28,000 users are watching pornography on the internet. So close to 30,000 people every second. That 3,000, over $3,000 is being spent on pornography on the internet every second. Every day, 68 million search queries are done for pornography, and that's 25%, one quarter of the entire search queries for the entire internet in one day is just for pornography. How online pornography is affecting just Americans. You think about 35% of all internet downloads are related to pornography. So in the US, 35% of internet downloads are related to pornography, and one third of porn viewers are women. There's more stats that I could go through there, but that's just startling to think about the fact that porn is moving into our culture and it's not a good thing. And there's both Christian and non-Christian organizations that are starting to notice this. But specifically, one of the reasons I want to do this video is in the church, this is a problem. This is not just a problem in the world. This is a problem in the church. According to Barna, 68% of men in the church view porn on a regular basis. That means if you pull 10 men from your congregation, from your church right now, Almost seven of them, 68%. So basically seven out of the 10 are regularly viewing pornography and exposed to it. 50% of pastors view porn on a regular basis. That's linked to Barna studies from about 2016. I'm sure after the pandemic and some other things, these numbers have changed, but I don't think they've probably gotten better. It says 11 to 17 year old boys are reported as its greatest users. Christians, 18 to 24 years old, 76% of them actively search for porn. That's over three quarters of that age bracket. 
It says 57%, this is what got me and why I had to do this video. 57% of pastors say pornography is the most damaging issue in their congregation. 7% of them say their church actually has a program to help those struggling with pornography. This is killing our churches. It's eroding underneath of us, our society, our, our sexual ethic. It's causing men to be passive. They're eroding what their spiritual vitality. I'm going to read a quote from Ortland later, where he, late, uh, Ortland later where he says, The man of God should be fully alive. And pornography is not, in, not allowing us to be alive spiritually. And that is a huge problem and we need to deal with it. So moving on, I just want to say up front, we are all sexual sinners. And I'm speaking from experience here. You don't need to know the depth, whether it was pornography, self-stimulation, lust, other things. But all of us are sexual sinners and we struggle sexually. And it's a battle for purity because our sexuality is not just sexual, it's also spiritual. It's deeply intimate. And so this is something that we need to give to God and surrender to him. So I want to go through some verses that have helped me that speak to the urgency of this issue and why we really need to talk about it. We need to talk about it in the right way, but we also need to say what the Bible says about it and call people to it. We don't need to be men passively in our churches who just justify it, say everyone else is doing it, and act like it's okay. It's eroding the foundation of our faith. It's eroding our spiritual vitality. It's, it's messing with our families. It's taking our homes, and we need to fight this monster. As, a, as Ortland would say, we need to be men of integrity, building a world of nobility. Here are some verses for you. Romans 3.10 talks about how we're all sinners. It says, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. We're all on level ground here. We're all sinners, and I would say we're all sexual sinners in one way or another because of what Jesus says in Matthew 5 on the Sermon on the Mount. Verse 27, it says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right eye causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go to hell. So Jesus tells us it's not just about what you do. It's not just the act. It's also what you think about. That when you, th our thoughts, we need to control our thoughts that can cause us to sin. And he specifically talks about lust here. And then he goes to the, the stream of telling us that this extreme sin, we need to go to extreme measures to fight this sin, to take this seriously. 1 Corinthians 6.18 gives more reference on this. It says, flee sexual immorality. That's any sex outside of the bounds of marriage, outside of the way God designed it to work, that sex is to be experienced between a man and a woman in the covenant of marriage. That's a beautiful thing. And when we pull that outside of that, it, it becomes twisted. It becomes sinful. And he says, flee sexual immorality. Flee those things. He says, every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but sexual immor the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price, so glorify God in your body. The truth is, your sex, your sexuality is not for you. It was given to you as a gift from God. It is a good gift. And it is supposed to be something that when you're single and unmarried, you, you dedicate to God and that you're not going to participate in that because God is where you live and you're not going to sin. But then when you're married, it's something that you both glorify God through and you give to your spouse exclusively. It is a gift to be enjoyed, but also to give to God first and dedication to him as we use that rightly and then to serve our spouse and love them in the marriage covenant. 
It says in 1 Peter 1, Therefore, preparing your minds for action to be sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be wrought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. We are to pursue holiness. We are to pursue living rightly before God. And that involves not just the way we live in integrity and honesty and the way we love and serve others, but also in the way we steward the gift of sex and sexuality. And I want to encourage you with those verses. There's more. I have a blog post that I wrote in 2017. I'm filming this right now in 2022. And so I'm going to link that in the video description below. It has amazing resources that have been very helpful for me and for other guys that I've discipled or worked through some of these struggles. So there's resources that I found helpful, messages, sermons, books, um, quotes, Bible verses. So I'd encourage you to check out that blog post after this video. Um, just so many resources there that God's helped me, and I'm sure that you have some as well. And I'd love for you to comment, even as we get to the end of this video, on things that um, have helped you in this struggle, in this journey, in this fight against sin. So with that, I want to take some time to go through the highlights of this book, which really spurred on this video and made me feel like I needed to say something about it. Because the temptation is we can read a book like this personally and then do nothing about it. Maybe there's one or two guys or, you know, in a relationship that we have that we're close to that we share with. Hey, I read this book and I really need accountability. Or maybe you're in a small group or something. But we don't talk about it as a church. And so I felt like I needed to do a video about this and just share about it so we can take this fight head on. And God can use this video to encourage you to fight sin where you are. And I want to go through some of the highlights of this book. So um, Ray Ortland says in that book that we are all sexual sinners and this is not a battle about porn. This is not just a battle about pornography, about sex, or even willpower, your willpower over sex or porn. It's a fight against evil and it's a fight for hope. And he says that on page 18 of this book. He goes on to into part one of reintroducing the characters, and I really love his approach. He talks about the first part, that you are royalty, and he's speaking to men here, but he knows that this also can be for women as well. He says, the glory of God is a man fully alive, and we can't be fully alive when we're hiding in secrecy and we're hiding in sin. So he says that on page 23. He goes on to say, The truth is, sin is an unchosen as hunger, as comfortable as sleep, as inevitable as gravity, as lethal as poison. And this truth, he says, sin offers itself as an option, but it takes over as a master. That's page 30. Sin offers itself as an option and takes over as a master. You may be sitting on the other side of this video and say, I do not have a pornography addiction. This is something that I have mastery over. I can choose when I view this and one day I'm going to get married and this is all going to go away and I'm going to say that's a lie from Satan himself. Yes, there are great things to be found in marriage. I'm married. There's amazing things to be found. But the battle still continues for us to be holy, for us to use sexuality in the right way and the battle just changes. There's no, that's a lie from Satan himself. And so we, sin is, presents itself as an option. You think you're, you have that option, but it becomes a master. It became, becomes an addiction. It becomes a ruling thing in our life. And we need to get rid of sin. We need to be killing sin in our life. He then moves to the end of the chapter where he talks about um, the fact that you are royalty. You've been created in God's image. He says, to, we must embrace Christ and prepare for the battle preparing for the battle of head. The time to be passive is over. He moves into chapter two about the fact that she is royalty. And he talks about the way pornography shapes our view of women, how it ha takes someone who's made in God's image, who's a person and changes her kind of into almost like an object to be consumed, a piece of meat. And he says, we need to change how we view women to how God views her to how God sees each one of them. And he talks about some of his own journey to do that as well. He says, he talks at the end of that about, and it's possible 
He speaks of a man who was involved in sexual sin. And he asks for God to change his heart to the point where eventually, just a couple months into this journey, just the thought of being impure, the impure thoughts he had, would cause him to vomit and have an actual physical response. And so I challenge you, ask God for that. Not just the fact that you could vomit or have a physical response, but ask God for a heart that actually hates sin, that wants to follow him, that doesn't want to entertain those negative thoughts. Moving into chapter 3, he talks about how Jesus is royalty, that Jesus is for you. He is the lion who conquers, who overcomes, but he is also the slain lamb, the sacrifice, the one who paid for sin. That Jesus is the savior and king whose kingdom is real and rising, and we should be the ones who stand up and follow him. From then, he moves into part two, where it's reimagining the future. And chapter four talks about the fact that we can do this. And he says, here's the way we need to do it. Let's start the fight now. And he gives three things that will keep you fighting in this fight. He says, what you're fighting for. We're fighting for noble things. We're fighting for the dignity of each human. We're fighting for God's plan. We're not fighting for shady things, sinful things. We're fighting for noble things, things that promote society, health, and individuals. He talks about The other thing that's going to keep you fighting, the second one is how you can fight well. He says that's going to keep you fighting is guarding your heart. Victory is won from the inside out, not from the outside in. We don't start doing the right things. We need to talk about guarding our heart, about actually um, attacking this issue from the inside out. And then the third thing he says that's going to keep us fighting is what winning will cost you. When we start seeing God give us victory, we're going to see it costing us the sin in some of the deepest and darkest places, but we're going to see God replace that through the Holy Spirit with life and light and freedom, and it's just going to feed our desire to keep up the fight. Moving into chapter 5, he says, we can work together. He says, you won't regain your integrity all by yourself. We need a community. We need people around us. If you're in a small group, you need to find some people who are the same, you know, guys with guys, ladies with ladies, two or three, and you need to get serious about this battle. He says, to choose to be alone is to invite sure failure on page 87. And then he moves into calling men specifically to a new brotherhood, a new world of integrity marked by confession, prayer, and healing. He says, confession, when we sinful men come together in Christ's presence for confession, he unites us as the brotherhood of his cross. Son, you can be impressive or you can be known, but you can't be both. And if you choose to be impressive, sin will kill you from the inside out. You can choose to be known or you can choose to be impressive. And it is better to be known that God might use us than it is to try to continue to be impressive and to hide secret sin that will kill us from the inside out. He says, the more isolated a man is, the more destructive his sin becomes. And those are on page 91 and 92. He moves into prayer and he talks about James 5, 16, about how we're supposed to pray for one another, that we may be healed. And that moves into the healing section. When we get real with the Lord, he gets real with us on page 97. Then he moves into chapter six. So we talked about how we work together, we need community, and then he gives this recipe for really how we can build a culture of nobility. He says, Jesus is calling you to build a new world of nobility on page 103. And here's some paths that we can take for building his new world straight from this book. He says, stay on the anvil. He says, be a man of growing integrity. He says, tell your story. Your experience will give hope to men who are drifting. I cannot tell you how many times when I've shared about the struggles I've had or the sins that I've faced, specifically in this area, how it provokes and encourages other men to open up about what they're experiencing or have been through in this area. Be men who actually tell your story when it's appropriate in the right way to the right people and inspire them to share what they're going through. And that breaks sin's power because we no longer feel like we're alone in this fight. He goes on to say, pray. Our prayers to God are not weak. 
We're picking a fight with demons. We're fighting our battles by God's strategy. And God is calling us into a lifestyle of prayer so that we experience lifelong power in page 112. We need to be praying. Spiritual forces are real things. We need God's power through prayer in our lives. He tells men, he says, get married. Marriage is an underrated strategy for the changing of the world on page 113. The truth is marriage is God's plan. And one of the beautiful ways to combat lust, um, pornography, this desire for sexual sin, is to focus on the beauty of God's plan. Not to set it up as an idol that it's going to make life perfect, but one of the ways that you can pursue God's plan is in His timing and in wisdom, be married and enjoy what God's plan was for sex and sexuality. He moves into five. He talks about um, creating. He talks about one other way to promote a world of nobility is if you have gifts in the arts, maybe you think, I'm not a teacher, I can't I can't influence people through politics and all these things. It's like, if you're a creative, use your gifting in the arts and use that gifting to build a world of nobility. He talks about number six, be an advocate, advocate for a new world of nobility. He says, brotherhood can replace porn more powerfully than laws can ban porn in page 116. He said, we may look for legislation and politics to get rid of pornography, but he says this, be an advocate for getting rid of pornography by living it out and having a community of people around you who are doing the same. And finally, he says, rejoice. Be a people who have joy in the Lord. Let your rejoicing be in the Lord and get loud about it. And then he ends the book with this quote, and I thought it was really good. He said, son, you can die magnificently or magnificently. It's this idea of no matter where you're at now, in sin, sinning against God, addicted to pornography. When we embrace God's power, we work hard. Over time, he can set us free and we can write a new story. There is hope for you. I want you to hear that in this video, that the the game's not over. If your heart's still beating, there is hope. And he says, you can die magnificently. You can die with a new story. He says, "Um, you can whisper with your final breath, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Hell will shudder with screams of demonic pain to lose you so finally when you win this battle. He says, heaven will shout with with angelic joy to receive you so eternally and you will leave behind a better world. So he's calling us to be men who fight sin, who rejoice in Christ, and then stir up a world of nobility around us, of people who are loving God, pursuing him, and following after him so that when we leave, we may leave a better story than we started with. So that's his call from this book. And I just would encourage those who are interested to pick it up, read it. It's an excellent read. Um, It's just about 120 some pages. Yep, 120 pages. Super easy, super good, great perspective on this. I want to finish this video with a pers- two personal exhortations for men specifically that I've used with guys I've mentored. And then I want to encourage you to leave some questions, comments, and helpful resources for me and for others to learn about this topic. So first, the exhortations. Um, when I was a student at Cedarville University, uh, we had a guy come and talk about this issue um, with the body. And then he had a late night session. And there were one of the girls there who asked a question, and I'm really glad that she did. Because one fear specifically Christian guys have is, I've struggled in this this area, or I do struggle in this area. What happens if I'm dating a great Christian girl, she finds out about that, and she doesn't want to marry me? What's going to happen? And so the girl at this Q&A asked the guy that was speaking after he was done, um, what happens if, if you've kept yourself from marriage? And then you're dating a guy and then he tells you about his struggle or past struggle with pornography. And I really loved his answer. He said, first off, I would say it's really great that you have followed God's plan. That's a good thing. He said, but I would also say that any guy who is not willing to talk about his struggles with sex or sexuality or his struggle with pornography, I would actually tell you to run away. Because he's not being real. 
because all of us struggle sexually. So for those who do struggle in that way, I'm just saying it's real. It's honest. Be honest about what you're doing. He said, I would encourage my daughter, if she were in your spot, to, to think about, to ask him, is he pursuing help? Is he seeing victory over that sin? And to be thankful that he's honest. Because he would say, I would say, if a man looks at, him, at me and says, or my daughter and says, I don't struggle with that, never have, he's lying. He's hiding sin and that's showing character. He says, so I would actually tell you that that's a good step when he says that. So then see if he's surrounded by people who are helping him have victory. Is he pursuing Christ? That's the thing we want to be after. You want to pursue a spouse who's not perfect, but who loves Jesus and is actively pursuing Christ and is getting help and trying to have victory over sin. And he said, at that point, once you've assessed that, if, if you feel that that's not something you want to go forward with, he's like, you can end it there. But he said, I just would caution you, make sure that whoever you're dating is being honest about their sin, is growing in Christ and is seeing victory over time and surrounded by people who are helping them grow in that battle and that victory. The second thing I would say is that victory comes by looking to Jesus. For years, I fought the area of sexual sin, lust, and tried to have uh, victory over that by just saying no. Like, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, you're trying to not focus on it. But by saying no, you end up actually focusing on the sin. And actually what gives you final victory over this sin in this area is not um, denying what God has put there as a healthy desire, but actually looking to the beauty of God's plan and desire for it. The fact that sex is a good thing, that it is a good gift that's been given to us by a good God for a purpose. And so not only do you say no to lust, to pornography, to self-stimulation, to sexual sin, but you look at God's plan and go, right now I'm using my body as a temple for the Lord. And there's a time in the future where I hope to be married, where I will get to experience that. And there's the beauty of the marriage covenant, the intimacy that comes from that. And so you start looking to God's beautiful design for sexuality. And that's a beautiful moment. And so I'd say that's one thing God taught me. And that's what um, Thomas Chalmers calls in his famous work, the expulsive power of a new affection. The truth is our love for sexual sin cannot be really driven out finally and completely. You may have seasons of victory, but it won't be driven out completely and, and finally until a greater love and affection is present. And that needs to be a love for God, for his plan, and for Jesus Christ. And so Thomas Chalmers in that work says, similar to a vacuum, is that when we take sin out of our lives, it creates a vacuum that wants to pull something else in. We see this all the time. If people who are addicted to, let's say, pornography, and they get rid of pornography, then they get addicted to alcohol, or addicted to they're addicted to cigarettes, and they pull that out, and then they get addicted to something else. And that's the nature of us as human beings. We kind of, we want to fill that void. And so it's a, and he's saying, Thomas Chalmers is saying in that work, we replace what is sinful with a greater love and affection for Jesus Christ. And that's what we were created to do. Um, finally, I just want to point you towards that blog post that I mentioned earlier. Um, there, it's linked in the video description below. It's on my blog. Um, it'll be clearly marked for you to check that out. Bible verses, sermons, books, things God's, God was teaching me um, through this. I want to end this video just by reading um, a small snippet from the top of my blog post that I think is still relevant for my heart towards you through this video. So he says, I'm posting this for my brothers and sisters bound by sexual sin who groan for a new story. And that's what I want to do through this video. It says, I have discovered no better strategy for fighting a battle with sexual sin than spending time in God's word abiding in his love and studying his grace and design for our sexuality. Therefore, I am sharing these resources and this video with you because I believe God has more for you. I believe that Jesus is big enough to save, strong enough to deliver, and forgives even the deepest and darkest of sin if we repent and run to him. I also believe your sex life and spiritual life are linked 
in ways you may never admit or understand. Sex is a great thing, a good thing, a gift from God, but it is a powerful and even spiritual thing, and few things can derail your future, crash your calling, or cut deeper than sexual sin. So I wanted to post all of these in one place with one message. Jesus loves you. He offers forgiveness, and only he can give victory over sexual sin. He can make you new. He waits with open arms for all who will repent, believe, and run to him. He is the ultimate desire of your heart. Your sexual sin does not have to define you. Let me say that again. Your sexual sin does not have to define you. There is hope and power in Jesus, a new identity, and he is more desirable than any earthly pleasure. I pray you find that. I pray this video has encouraged you. I would love to learn more from those who are watching this video. So if you have comments, I pray that you be charitable with those. If you have resources, things, verses, Bible verses, things God has helped you with as you've gone after him, as you've pursued him, as you fight the battle against pornography and sexual sin, I'd love to hear about those in the comments. I want to encourage you towards Jesus Christ. Jesus loves you. Your battle with sexual sin does not have to be the end or the defining marker of your story. You can pursue Jesus today. So I'd encourage you, find this book, check out, this, check out that blog with some resources, including sermons and books that I've shared, and I will link in the description. Get in God's word, pursue after Jesus, and follow him with everything. God bless. I'll see you guys soon.